for those of you just joining us, we are thrilled to be joined today by Maricela Trevino Orta and Robert Ramirez, the playwright and director, respectively, of this gorgeous production of The River Bride. Uh, so that being said, I would love to invite Maricela and Robert to join us on camera so people can stop looking at me, talking at my camera. We can look at you. Hello, welcome Maricela Trevino Orta and Robert Ramirez to join us for our first play talk of the season. Um, Maricela, uh, Robert I know is in Pittsburgh. I'm not sure Maricela where you're joining us from. Uh, I am currently in Austin, Texas. Okay, thank you, the wonder of Zoom. Um, I'm not gonna be here for long because I'm not the one you wanna to talk to, but I did wanna share that Maricela is joining us as you see, turning her mic off for the moment, that she has been under the weather, but has uh, gotten it together to join us today. I'm really grateful. I've also encouraged her, should she need to tap out, to leave early if she needs to. Um, and again, I'm so grateful you're here. Um, I wanna encourage those guests who are here with us to type questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom. And that once we have let Robert, Rami, Robert Ramirez and Maricela talk a bit about the play, we can open it up to questions from the group. And we usually are here about 35, 40 minutes. So when we've got about 10, 15 left, I'll take some questions. And now without further ado, I'm gonna turn my camera off and leave it to you both. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Hi, Maricela. Hi, Robert. Hi. Um, so I, I actually, uh, right now I'm, I'm zooming in from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but I do reside in Austin, Texas. Maricela and I have been trying to find a time to get together and talk. The, the universe has been conspiring against us, um, but we'll make it happen. We will make it happen. So um, first, for all of you uh, watching, thank you. Thank you for, for being here today. Um, and if you've seen the show already, uh, thank you for coming to the theater and for sharing this story, sharing in this story with us and, and um, in this, uh, as we struggle to find our footing in a sort of mid post pandemic world, uh, going to the theater, going to a live event, sitting with and having a communal experience with a large group of people has taken on a completely different meaning um, and not just for those people in the audience but also for the people on stage and for those of us in process you know and so um, it's been a really really wild time moving through a, a rehearsal process uh, trying to dodge COVID and thankfully we've been able to do it really successfully up to this point knock on wood and we'll continue to do so. Um, so, but you know, Maricela, I'm going to ask you some questions that I that I have asked you a hundred times before. But for the for this group, we're going to we're going to come to them fresh and new. And so, I you know, I wanted to start by sharing that that you know, I I consider myself really fortunate enough to have a long history with this play and with Maricela and her relationship with the the writing of the play. Um, back at, at, at its world premiere at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And, you know, for someone whose career has been primarily in the realm of classical theater and Shakespeare, um, this experience, the experience of being with the playwright for six weeks, doing playwrights, trying out new scenes and, and sort of bouncing ideas off of a group of artists collaborating was just, was mind blowing for me. And it, it really did alter the direction of, of my career. And it really did alter um, what I knew up to that point fundamentally to be a theater making experience. And so I wanted to start Maricela by asking, you know, about your, your trajectory as an artist, um, sort of how you came to write The River Bride, you know, what, what was the uh, sort of what, what was the First, what was the the seed and the inspiration? And then if you could talk to us too a bit about that whole process of, of arriving at a finished script, you know, what that was like. I forget any of the questions you just proposed, just like throw them back at me. <laughs> just toss them back at me. Um, my trajectory uh, as an artist is where I think I'm gonna start. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I've been writing since, from a very young age, like I was an avid reader as a child, and I mainly wrote short stories and fiction. And then in high school, those angsty teen years, you know, I started writing bad angsty poetry. 
and I continued to write poetry all through college. My um, <clears throat> undergraduate degree is in Latin American history. And I had this romantic notion that I would become a history professor and like write poetry on the side, kind of like Wallace Stevens or something like that. Um, Cause I had no idea what academia was really like. When I graduated, um, I was trying to find my footing in the world. I had not applied to graduate school for history. I was trying to figure out what to do next. And the thing I kept coming back to was my writing and specifically the poetry at the time. So I left um, my home state of Texas where I grew up and I went to the University of San Francisco to get a master's of fine arts in creative writing, specifically studying poetry. And it was while I was there that just kind of by happenstance, I crossed paths with um, theater and found, you know, found that genre. Um, and it was like, this is a genre I'd been searching for. It has the narrative qualities that I like from, sh you know, from like short stories and, and fiction writing. It has so many poetic elements to it as well. Um, but there was something about it, specifically since the theater I began with was uh, social justice theater. One of the topics I never could write as a poet, like I found struggle, I struggled as a poet was anything political. I felt like I was hitting people over the head with my poem, but watching people put together a piece of art that explored a social issue made sense to me, like because of the empathy that theater creates for you know its characters, like amongst the audience for the characters. I found that super powerful. And that's what really kind of drew me to theater. And so, uh, so I shifted gears. I stayed in San Francisco and started writing plays. And it was sort of like doors kept opening in ways that they had never opened in poetry. So it was sort of like a big hint from the universe saying, this is the way you should be pointing yourself. And I did. I considered going back to grad school at the beginning of my journey, but I was very adamant that I wasn't going to go into debt again because I had plenty of debt for my poetry MFA. So it's very, very obstinate. I was like, no, I'm not going to, no, I'm going to, I'm going to just watch plays, read plays, and write and kind of to be an autodidactic person, you know, come about it that way. Um, <clears throat> when we met in 2016, um, that was my first big, like, national production. Mm -hmm. And so that was a really important like, moment for me. I'd had a couple of local productions, like regional productions in the Bay Area. Um, but OSF has such a long rehearsal process. It's very unique. Uh, and that was going to be an opportunity for me to learn how to be in a rehearsal, uh, how to collaborate in a different way and a for a longer period of time. And I wanted to work on the play while I was there. I felt like it still needed work. Um, it just so happened that uh, as OSF was asking to produce the play, I had been accepted to graduate school for playwriting. And so thankfully, the University of Iowa, the Iowa Playwrights Workshop was very open. To, they have these things called residency semesters where they're like, okay, yeah, you can go away for an entire, not the entire semester, but for the rehearsal process, keep a journal and turn it in for a grade. And so that's, that really, that told me that was the place I needed to be because there was a flexibility mm -hmm. that they were offering to their students. Um, so that's the journey and kind of like where we met. What am I missing? What are the yeah. questions that you have? No, no, that's that's really fantastic to hear. And I mean, what a what a what an incredibly um, uh, fortuitous uh, and auspicious beginning to a graduate school career. <laughs> I know. Oh, right? you asked about <laughs> you asked about inspiration. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Let me take a sip of water. I'll take, one. I'll, I'll take one. one. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, just where the inspiration for the play came from. What was that? If you could recall that or that initial spark, the it idea was, of the play. So I was working on my first fairy tale play. I didn't know it was going to be the first fairy tale play, but I was working on a play um, called Wolf at the Door. I first thought I was writing a myth, but then realized that it was actually a fairy tale and that kind of unlocked something in my head that made sense to me because I was very familiar. I grew up with like the Western fairy tale canon. I knew that very well, like the Grimm's fairy tales. Um, and so that gave me some structure because there's things that you find in fairy tales, like the number three, um, uh, you know, of quote unquote villain kind of protagonist. And so that play has a villain. Um, and that play also has shape-shifting. There's a character that shapeshifts, So that's what's important to know. So I had been working on that play for a minute. 
for a little bit. And um, I was doing laundry one day and watching, there was this TV series a while back on Animal Planet called River Monsters. I used to love watching that show, just watching that guy fish. <laughs> and they were having a marathon. And so I was watching it, the you know, episodes I had already seen. And I guess the producers were trying to make it more interesting to viewers who were re-watching something. So they were flashing bits of trivia across the bottom of the screen. And the episode about the Amazon is about um, the piranhas that live in the Amazon. And so the host is like throwing fish into the water and, and you can't see because the Amazon's so muddy what's coming up and eating the fish, right? You just see the water kind of moving. And he's the, the music is so ominous. It's like, there's something that lives in the river that even the piranhas are afraid of. And then he gets into the river and they're the pink dolphins, <laughs> they're the dolphins. And that's when I looked, happened to look up at the screen and the trivia that flashed across the bottom talked about or mentioned that there was folklore associated with uh, the river dolphins um, about them coming on shore and turning into men. And I was, it was kind of like a light bulb went off and I was like, because of the fact that my first play has shape shifting. So I went and looked up information about um, that piece of folklore and decided, oh, I guess I'm writing, gonna write three plays, three fairy tales. As a poet, that's like the thing, you know, three is a very important number for poetry as well. And I was like, I guess I'm gonna write more than one fairy tale, this will be the second one. And so that's where it started um, <clears throat> originally. The River Bride was going to be one of those fairy tales where the protagonist gets their comeuppance, like a spoiled protagonist kind of learns a lesson, right? But as I started writing it, um, the older sister, Elena, was just so much more interesting to me. And it changed Moisesh from a trickster character into someone much more earnest, much more like, like the Little Mermaid, you know, mm -hmm. coming ashore, looking for love genuine in that search for, for love. Um, so that's kind of where it all started. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, that's, that, that's the, the, the thing that I admire so much about writers is um, I have all kinds of wild ideas that come into my mind, you know, but I don't, I don't go down the road of, of actually researching it and then writing a play, <laughs> you know, because it's a really wild idea that you have fleshed out into this beautiful, um, hour of poetry and dialogue. Um, how much of, you know, if you could talk a little bit about how the play changed over the course of that, that, that long period of rehearsal when you were writing and arriving at the final, at the, at the final draft. And, yeah, and, like, and sort of like, what were the things that were influencing it? Um, one of the big things that I feel like was getting worked on was the scene where the sisters have an argument mm -hmm. and kind of fight, like trying to calibrate it just right. And so I think that was our Thunderdome mm -hmm. rehearsal mm -hmm. where I brought in three different versions of that scene to try and test out because I wanted to hear it. I wanted to see it on its feet and hear it coming yeah. out of the actors, like, like them actually reading the pages so I could get a better sense of which was the right direction to head into. That's mm -hmm. what's so valuable about the rehearsal process is that some of these things that you on the page seem to work, once you actually have your actors inhabiting those roles, you learn so much more about the world and about the characters and the story. So I remember that was a big, and I still was calibrating that even in its second big production I went out and was still kind of tweaking that scene. I also remember, <clears throat> excuse me, do you remember the improv that we did? Yes, yes, yeah. And that, that had to do with um, the scene when um, Moisesh is brought into the house mm -hmm. for the first time, he's unconscious and trying to kind of like flush out this moment of um, conversation amongst the household members. And so we had just kind of let the actors play around and, and use some of their in, improv chops to kind of give me some inspiration for what made sense, what might, what actual conversation might they have about the stranger in their home. So that was another like um, important um, part of the rehearsal process that helped with the writing. 
Yeah. For those of you who aren't uh, familiar with the uh, Mad Max oeuvre, uh, it, it beyond beyond in the film Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, there's sort of a, a, a gladiator dome where and then they're they're chanting, um, you know, uh, two men two enter, enter, one man, one man leaves. leaves. And and Maricela said, well, we're going to Thunderdome it. Three, we're, I'm going to come in with three scenes, and one will be the win- <laughs> one will be the winner, <laughs> yeah. which was which was um, so so interesting to me. And the difference between those three scenes, there were some differences that were that were huge, and then some that were just minute. And I love that you use the term uh, calibrating, you know, the, the calibrating of the scene because the the sort of the the dynamic of of power and of blame and of um, who uh, both sadness and anger is so delicate in that scene, you know, and it's so easy to push it into a um, to push it into a, a realm that is highly melodramatic, you know, which is which is not not what the play is asking for, you know, uh, absolutely not. I, I you know, it, it's 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 so interesting to hear you talk about um, actors improving and them being the sort of the giving you stuff to play with, you know, as you're in your writing process, you know, when we're working on plays that are hundreds of years old, uh, uh, hundreds of years old, you know, there's all, I think sometimes we, we, we put ourselves into a, we bend ourselves into a pretzel, trying to figure out how to make these words that already exist, bend to our purposes. And, um, Sometimes, sometimes successfully, and sometimes incredibly not, you know. But the 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 magic of having a, a writer, you know, on the premises, you know, um, because there were days where I would just think, wait a minute, what? There's new page. Like, where did these come from? You know. But the magic of having a playwright in the room who's who's directly being inspired by the actors, you know, it was was something that I I had never experienced before, you know, and that very few people who work in in the classical theater do. And, and you know, it, it's interesting too, because this, this play, you know, for me, and I, I always thought this is a perfect play for APT because it is so, because language really is the primary vehicle by which all of this is happening. I mean, there, there is a series of scenes that all happen in the same spot on a pier and yet somehow, um, and I can't wait for you to see our production because I'm, I'm dying to hear what you think. But 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 somehow there's a a, a a dynamic transformation that happens to the lead character over the course of an evening, you know. And all of that is happening through conversation. All of it is happening through through talk, you know. Um, you met with the cast and I uh, uh, several weeks back. It's sort of at the beginning of our rehearsal process, and and we talked a little bit about about the poetic nature of the writing. And I was just sort of wondering um, if you could share with with our audience here tonight a little bit of how you see that relationship between your poetry and your dialogue and sort of what are the things maybe that you struggle with there and what are the things that you really think are, are have, have been some great roads to go down? If you could talk a little bit about that. It's, it was so interesting when I started writing this play, the characters, that was how they were showing up on the page. It was very elevated language. And I would kind of think to myself, why are they talking so formally? <laughs> like, I didn't understand why they were expressing themselves this way. Um, and I know you'd think, well, Manisela, you're the playwright, you're the one writing. It's like, yeah, but when you, the way I approach my writing is that I, I have to first really know my characters. They have to feel like fully formed people. So then the things that are coming out of their mouth make sense because it's like, that's how they would say it, you know? So I didn't understand why everyone was speaking so formally, but I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to let it be what it wants to be and just see where it goes. Um, so it was very strange at the beginning. And then, but throughout the process of writing that first draft, it did feel like a return to my roots as a poet, you know, being able to kind of like lean into language and lyricism. Um, one of my favorite quotes, as I started my journey as a playwright, when I, I did not know that um, Federico Garcia Lorca wrote plays, I knew him as a poet. 
I found out he wrote plays. I was like, oh my gosh. What? <laughs> yeah. And his plays are fantastic. I mean, I mean, I, I, when I was first writing Wolf at the Door, I was constantly thinking about Blood Wedding. Which you know? is so wild because when I first read Wolf at the Door, uh, that I just kept thinking about Lorca and I thought yeah. I was thinking a lot about Bernarda Alba, you yeah. know, and, and about the women, this, this house of women, you know, and I was, I thought that's so wild. That's because that's, that was the, one of the first things that came into my mind. So when I first started my playwriting journey, Lorca was a huge kind of inspiration for me. One, my favorite, my favorite quote about playwriting comes from Lorca. And he said, a play is a poem standing up. And that just resonated with me. I was like, that makes so much sense. It was just like, my head was kind of exploding open. I was like, yes, yes. All the things that I used in poetry, lyricism, structure, repetition, metaphor, imagery, those can be used in playwriting. They are the tools of a playwright. Now to varying degrees, depending on what play I'm working on, I may not use all those tools. I do feel like River Bride is one of the plays where a lot of those tools are being, you know, yeah. harnessed and used. Um, but it was, it was in the rehearsal process at OSF that when, like hearing the director, Lori Woolery talk about the work also opened my eyes up a bit about my own work. Because one of the things that, that Lori told the actors was don't be precious with this language. Don't try and treat it like you're reciting a poem. And she's so right, because I've seen people try to do that, but I couldn't articulate what was happening. But it felt yeah. like it felt like a stone just sinking to the bottom of a pool. Yeah. Like it just felt yeah. dead, like 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 sleepy and drawn out. But so her approach to and, and what I've told people when it comes to my elevated when my elevated language, anyways, because I'm not sure how this tracks with other work, is to just say the words and the poetry lifts yeah. itself up on its own you don't have to yeah. you don't have to work hard for it which is something we talked about uh, quite a bit during our rehearsal process you know and really you know choosing that there are moments in the play i think where where the character is actively actively pursuing this really um florid way of speaking but not purely as a means of sounding beautiful but but as a means to an end you know, and that, that we have to remember that people want things, human beings want things, they want to make things happen, you know, and so uh, just say it, you know, just say it, allow it, allow it to be as beautiful as it is, but it doesn't need any help from you, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't need you to make it into poetry, that the poetry is already, it's, it's already there, yeah. you know, and what was interesting to me too, having come back to the play, you know, I mean, I sat with that script and poured over it for weeks. And, and then when we first started this process, and, and for those of you who don't know this, you know, this play was actually scheduled to be produced the summer that the pandemic broke out. And so we've kind of, we were on hold for kind of a couple of years before we were able to come back and do this. And so I was, I was going back into the play periodically to just kind of make sure that I was maintaining my relationship with it. And, you know, I just want you to know that even after all these years, I was still in rehearsal hearing this incredible cast of actors speak these lines going, oh, that little Pete, you know, when you're talking about all those poetical devices, you know, it's like, oh, listen to that, that connects to this, this connects to, and that, you know, and that's also the, the voice and text director in me, which is how I, I got my, my start at APT. Um, it, it, it's uh, poetry, you know, I, I often think, um, so in Shakespeare, I talk a lot about, about uh, when we're talking about the shift between verse and, and with, between prose and verse. And I often say, well, you know, it's very much like a musical. The, the person has no choice but to burst into song. Their heart is so overflowing, but they have no choice but to burst into song. And I think the same thing about, about bursting into verse, and I think the same thing in this play about going into a long narrative about your past and describing it with such crystal detail and such romanticism and also sadness, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's it's just, which is why I think, you know, the audiences at APT have really responded to it, you know, because it's a theater and an audience that really values language mm -hmm. and they value the beauty of language and also the power of it, you know, the, the power of it. Um, if you were uh, 
so if you're going to talk to, if you're going to say to somebody who was about to see this play, um, what you wanted them to pay attention to, what would it be? Oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, I think it would have, to, maybe I would, right now my answer is the couples, the different couples mm -hmm. that are in the play, the different pairings that you see in their relationships. Um, Cause there's more than just one couple in the play. And I think sometimes people forget um, that there's something happening with some of the other couples that is yeah. bouncing off or contrasting with uh, the main romantic couple. Yeah. What's interesting, you said this thing, you said this thing once um, about uh, the couples are all in a different, sort of a different place and a different stage. And, and you know, um, the couple that, that actually gets sort of the least, you know, quote, airtime as a couple is the parents. And, and they're the ones that really, that somehow got it right. Like they somehow, somehow by some magic, you know, uh, they got it right. And it's a mixture of both actual magic. And then I think the practical magic of just accepting love into your life, accepting, accepting the gift that's been, that's been laid before you, you know, mm -hmm. um, I think that's a great piece of advice for someone who's about to see this play. Absolutely. Um, I've asked you a bunch of questions. Do you want me, do you want to ask me a question about directing the play? <laughs> huh. You don't have to, I don't want to put well, you on. Well, you... okay, so here's a question. Um, yeah. As you worked on the play at its world premiere and you've had time with it, was there anything that you, go, going into your rehearsal process that you were like, this is going to be the thing that I have to stick the landing on? <laughs> Yeah, the the end of the, the 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 climax of the play, the the trans the the I don't want to spoil no spoilers, but something pretty dramatic and devastating happens uh, towards the end of the play, and um, that was the thing that I I really uh, I had a, a substantial amount of nerves about, although I had an idea what I wanted to do, and um, you know. Uh, Every theater, every theater has its limitations. And sometimes those limitations are just practical. They're the limitations of the space, you know? Uh, when we first made this play together, it was on a very large stage that had a trap and had uh, automation and, and mm. tons of, you know, projections. I mean, it was a lot of show, right? And the Touchstone Theater, I love so much because it's such an intimate space, but um, it's also small. It doesn't have a trap in the floor. There's no way to have something disappear or appear. And so, you know, I had to really ask myself, okay, how are you gonna accomplish this in a way that's both satisfying and uh, uh, thrilling for the audience, but at the same time fits into your uh, aesthetic as a director, as an art maker. And, you know, I'm a huge, huge um, lover of dance and contemporary dance and how contemporary and the language of the body and the storytelling that the body can do um, in, in tandem with oral effects, with sound and with light, with the aura of the thing. And so, um, yeah, and then, and then fortunately for me, you know, earlier this, this year, I directed a production of Mother Road by Octavio Solis. And I was fortunate enough to have in my mm -hmm. cast the absolutely divine, uh, Marilet Martinez, uh, who I asked to be my AD on this show. And Marilet is a, an amazingly talented writer, performer, director, maker, and um, but who has a, a huge background in movement work. And so we were able to really, um, in our partnership and with the with the actors, create something that I thought so that that for me exceeds my exceeds my expectations. And I think actually, um, tells the story in a way that that keeps that moment creates a through line and keeps the audience on that story with 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 that family all throughout the the horror of it you know and so 
That's just my own inflated opinion of myself. You'll be the judge, Marisa. <laughs> you, I have to say that was super exciting when I found out that you had invited Marilette to come yeah. here, AD, because she and I, I know she's she's my, one of my best friends and I've known her for, oh gosh, I think we first started collaborating. I mean, she's an, I knew her first as an actor and she was mm-hmm. in a reading for one of my plays and then she was in the world premiere for Heart Chick Nebula there in the, in the Bay Area. And we've been really good friends. Um, Ah, since the early aughts, yeah. it seems like. Yeah, I think a lot of people. Um, I, I think a, a lot of people don't necessarily know how many hands and voices and and minds and hearts go into uh, the making of a play. You know that there are uh, the the and and also you know in line with the kind of room that I like to run and the kind of space that I like to create where. You know, I don't, as a director, I don't see myself as a, you know, any kind of auteur or or sort of like genius behind the production. I mean, I have strong ideas and I, 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 I have a strong voice in the room, but, you know, I believe in the magic of actors and I trust them as an actor. You know, I trust actors. And I think that if you've got, I mean, there's so many things in this play that were just brought into the room by this amazing cast of actors that we have, you know, um, all of whom, you know, have had, you know, have been sitting with the play for varying lengths of time, you know, but um, to to have a space where, you know, Marilette can come in as an as an AD and and make such a significant contribution to the storytelling and to the making was such a gift, you know, and I want to, I mean, I really, that's a, that's, that's in credit to APT for, for their providing the resources and the forethought about this, especially as we were heading into a, a, a rehearsal process that possibly could involve people being sick and, and mm. people dropping out and things coming to a halt, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I, I want to share with you that I think this is, no, I don't think I know. This is the proudest I think I've ever been of a piece of work that I have made. Oh, it's beautiful. I, I really, I, I did not want to leave once the show opened. I think about it every day. Uh, I can't wait to go back and see it again. And, you know, one of the things that I've struggled with in my, my career, well, really my whole life is for sort of like, the, the sort of like stamina to be with something for a really long period of time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and seeing plays over and over again when I was working on them. And I, I just, something about this process, I just, you know, every night I went to rehearsal, every time we did a run, was so excited to see it again and to hear it again and be with it again and try to figure out how best to serve your intentions as a playwright, you know? Um, and I'm really, really grateful to APT for giving us the space and the time and the and the resources to make that happen. Um, we have a couple of questions um, and uh, or a question and a comment. But our first question is from Tim A. And Tim says, uh, I saw this in previews and was deeply moved. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I am interested in teaching this to a high school class of mostly BIPOC students. Do you have any suggestions for teaching the play? Is there a video version that could be shown? Do you know of any teacher resources? Um, unfortunately, copyright law and actors equity, our union forbids us from ever uh, filming uh, performances. That's, that's, uh, that is a very rare, rare thing. So there's no video of the play in its entirety that can be used. But Maricela, do you have suggestions for the teaching of the play or do you know of any teaching resources? I believe that, <clears throat> Um, Arizona Theater Company, uh, when they produced it, created um, some sort of teaching guide. Mm. I think they did. Like I was able like to Google and find like sometimes you Google things and you're like, oh, look at this. There's a nice, very nice like mm. PDF. And it was multiple things about the show. Great. Um, uh, yeah, no, I don't think there's any other like guides. Um, I guess, I mean, I think I would approach the play as if it was a poem because that could give you like um, things to look at, like reading and going over the play with students. You could look at, well, let's talk about repetition in the play. Yes. You know, lines or yes. moments that come up and how, how I think in playwriting specifically, I mean, this happens throughout all different mediums of literature. Um, 
uh, and also in film, but how repetition collapses time on stage. How when we hear a line repeated by another character that's come out of somebody else's mouth, we're, we're taking whatever that first time we heard it and putting it on stage with the current moment and it creates a context. Mm. Um, so rep looking at repetition or just looking at um, language, like maybe looking at a section, just maybe a monologue that you find particularly poetic and reading it and kind of looking at the language to say, well, let's look at it as if it was a poem. Where do we see metaphor? Where do we see, mm. um, uh, Oh gosh, what is that? Um, the repetition of like one syllable word, uh, alliteration. Oh, alliteration. <laughs> I was like, what's the word? Uh, um, so like well, maybe approaching a monologue as if it was a poem. Yeah, mm -hmm. one of the things that really stuck out to me uh, in this in directing this production was um, things that are said early in the play by one one character that are then repeated by another character that happen almost in sort of a book ending kind of fashion or in yeah. a way that is, that is really um, like, oh, uh, uh, I thought it's such a beautiful way of keeping the story, keeping the idea or the main argument aloft via, via repetition, you know? Yeah. Um, that, that's like, I think just such an important, uh, just like rhetorical device, you know, in, yeah. in storytelling. I thought was really, really, I thought you did such a, excellent such an excellent job of that so i would definitely definitely look at that i would say also and you know um for those of you who don't know i i am a, a teacher and i've been in in higher education for almost 20 years now and um one of the things that i would pay attention to too is um as an exercise is to take the long just take the long speeches by each of those characters, those long speeches, take them out of the context of the play and just look at them on their own uh, uh, structurally and, and to see what is, the, what is the idea that's being fleshed out and, and how, is, how, is, how are poetical devices part of that, you know? I think what I love about each of those, those speeches is, um, you know, they are, rec a lot of them are recollections, you know, uh, they all recall this moment of falling in love and yet they all serve a purpose. They're making something happen and move forward. I think a really good example is uh, Senor Costa's uh, recollection of his meeting his wife. And yes, it's a beautiful memory, memory but what it does in that scene, in the scene is it inspires and it spurs Moises on uh, to to really pursue what he's after which is love you know which is love um margaret and samuel jonas say i was startled and truly frightened by the stylized movement near the end of the show uh the spell was cast and you know aside from Ma uh, marilette our ad i have to give a huge shout out to our actors Gabriela Castillo and uh, Ron, uh, Roman Melendez, who are both phenomenal movers and really, really just such game actors who were willing to just throw themselves at, at it. Because as I was describing it, I was like, this sounds preposterous. And yet, <laughs> and yet um, they really threw themselves at it and they're doing such a beautiful job at every performance of continuing to develop that physical narrative. Uh, Michael Schall, thank you so much for this discussion. We were going to ask if it was based on a real folk tale, but you answered that. All the sound additions were so well done. We were sitting in the second row and we were afraid of getting wet. Such a wonderful, beautiful play. Thank you. Um, thank you, Michael. Brandon, Brandon Reed is a, a really brilliant, brilliant um, sound designer for the theater who's based in Chicago. Uh, I've known him for many years. He worked on a production of Julius Caesar with me some time ago that was really phenomenal. And, and he's someone that I'm interested in maintaining a relationship with. And, and, you know, really it was super important for me that the river and the water be um, sort of omnipresent, you know, that it be, that, that we never forget, that we never forget, um, that we are on the bank of the river or that we are on a pier that is built out onto the river, that the river is calling to them, that the river is threatening them, that the river is nurturing and healing them. And so that sound element was, was super, super important to me in the storytelling, you know, that nature, 
that nature, birds, insects, uh, and, and the sound of the water moving, sometimes rushing and sometimes trickling, that the sound of the rain be as sort of um, enveloping as possible. And again, this is what's really wonderful about working in a space like the, like the Touchstone that's so intimate because we were able to really sort of, um, pardon the pun, submerge the audience mm -hmm. into, into that environment. So uh, I'm really, really grateful that you had that experience. Thank you, Michael. And Tim, you are welcome. You are absolutely welcome. And also, cheers and thanks for wanting to teach this play to young people. Uh, that's, yes. that's really, really beautiful and very moving. Do we have more questions? Or if not, I have one for you. Yeah, go for it. Well, the since you had brought up um, the, the sound designer, I was thinking about the set designer because this is mm -hmm. Regina's second time yes. uh, designing for the show. And so I was really curious to know like what your conversation, like what she said to you since this is her second um, yeah. go at, at designing the, the set. Well, here's how it started. And I'm not exaggerating or joking. I'm gonna say exactly how it started. Uh, Regina and I are, are longtime colleagues. We, we taught together at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana uh, many years ago. Um, and and we've, we've remained really good friends and artistic collaborators over the years. Uh, and I've been watching Regina's career just blow up as an artist in the last 10 years. I mean, it's just what she's doing is just phenomenal. And, and in, in so many different kinds of venues and at different sort of like uh, with, with different kinds of resources, you know. But the first thing I said, and you know, this is the thing, when you're connected to a production and then you get to go do another production, there's always that nagging fear, like, oh, I don't want to copy it and I don't want to reproduce it. But um, I am not, I am, I am not a fan of the literal. I, I, I am not. <laughs> even, even and, and, and I felt like this play, even though the circumstances for the most part are, set re are realistic the nature of the language being so being what it is being heightened and poetical and the fact that there is actual magic in the play that there is an actual element of supernatural even further um pushed pushed for me pushed me in the direction that i'm usually going in which is one of abstraction and one of not reality and so what i said to to Regina when we first met was like, okay, here's what we're not gonna do. We're not gonna do a house with a pier. Cause it's been done, one. Cause one, it's been done. And two, it's too, for me, it's just too normal. And mm. there's, and this play is anything but normal. Mm -hmm. What I wanted was, a structure that was an abstraction of all of those things and that could be used for multiple purposes. What I, what I, what I think is so powerful about, about having a, and I also am interested in an unabashedly theatrical experience. I'm not trying to fool anyone into thinking that we're not sitting in a theater watching a play together. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. We're in a theater watching a play together. And so, the, ge the, the gestures of, of the scenic and lighting elements, I think should be, should be um, grand and, and otherworldly, you know? And so we've, we've got a space that has so much uh, dramatic tension in it, simply by virtue of its being asymmetrical and being an abstraction of the, both of those things where the same spot can be several different places. And the water remains the water, Mm -hmm. And the boat is a boat, but it's not really a boat. It, 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 there's so many things about it that, you know, to the literal mind, it appear like, well, well, I thought we were at home and now we're here, you know. Um, and, and like I said, I'm just, I'm so not interested in that. I, I, I'm much more interested in us being on an emotional journey and that the emotional journey allows for us to have an extra expanded suspension of disbelief, you know, and, mm -hmm. and. I knew I could say that to Regina and that she would know exactly what I meant because the first thing she came back with me blew my mind. Mm. And then for Regina, because she's a perfectionist, it was just, I mean, it was literally weeks and weeks of her tweaking it by a foot and another foot. And then this foot, a foot that, and then another foot, you know? And, mm. um, you know, what I, 
I'm a big fan of like um, the highbrow, lowbrow crossover. You know, I mean, I think Regina's a phenomenal artist and such a great thinker and a really with a really sophisticated taste level and she just shows up and rolls her sleeves up and like gets the work done and, and, and is thinking super practically at the same time you know so um yeah that's that's what we arrived at and you know what was really super fun everybody was when we got there I was able to start texting sending Maricela uh, uh rehearsal shots like shots of the set, shots of the actors in action. Oh, look, this is our Belmira. She's amazing. Oh, this is this is our Moises. Look at this, that. Um, and it was it was my way of being able to keep you, Maricela, you involved in the production, even though you were in Texas while we were in Wisconsin. You know, and again, I mean, how many times have I wanted to text William Shakespeare, but to no avail? You know, I've all I want to call him up and ask him questions like. <laughs> He just but, leaves. He leaves you on read. <laughs> but he leaves me on hold. Yeah, he leaves me on red. Um, do we have any other any other questions? I'm so grateful. I want to keep listening and talking to you both forever. Um, <laughs> we're at our time. I just wanted Great. to to just say thank you. And there are two just preparing to have you with us, Maricel and Robert. Got to read the play again. And to the question about teaching this play, this play is so beautiful on the page. I'm tremendously proud of this production, but there are lines and I wanna read something because if you haven't read the play, you won't have heard these words of Maricela's that are at the beginning of this play. And they're so beautiful. I wanna see your work as a poet as well, Maricela, but at the beginning of this printed production, this printed uh, script, it says, in the Amazon time stands still as if this river wrapped its long body around it and contracted. The only time here is once, once upon a time, somewhere between dream, between myth, between the shores of reality and folklore. It is <laughs> using all the devices you use in the play. It's repetition, it's visual, and I'm so grateful for your words. And Robert, I'm so, so proud of this production. I'm telling you, one of the best things about my job is I just get to go see this play all the time. <laughs> It gives yeah. me faith and hope, and I'm so proud of it. I'm grateful to you both. I can't wait to see it. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in today's conversation and to get to see Robert before I see him in person. We um, are going to see each other before I leave the state of Texas. Yeah. And it was so lovely to, to hear the, the prelude read aloud. That was the first thing I wrote before I started writing the play. Wow. I mean, there's another paragraph, but I did, but that, that, and what that, that scenic design is used ended the conversation talking about scenic design, how that story is told scenically by those brilliant designers inhabited by this extraordinary cast. Really yeah. one of those moments where you get that gift when it all comes together. Wonderful. So I just want to finish by, by thanking if you, you know, like I said, if you have, if you have seen this play, if you, if you took time out of your life and and money out of your wallet to buy a ticket and to come and sit in, in and experience the theater live and experience the story in person thank you thank you for sharing sharing this work with us and for being part of uh the continuum of maricela's work and her journey as an artist um and all of our work uh, the entire team if you haven't seen the play yet and you're watching this as a prelude to seeing the play um i know you're going to love it uh, I have I have absolute faith in that. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. Um, you know, there are a lot of contemporary playwrights writing work, and I know I'm not exaggerating what, exaggerating when I say that this play is like this gem that has endured for years now and is going to continue to be produced because of the beauty of its writing and the power of its story. So. Uh, thank you, Maricela, for, for your work as an artist and for, for your openness to being in process with, with all the artists across the country that you are, uh, who are, who are making your work and, and, and bringing it into, bringing it to life and actualization and realization on stage. And um, keep everybody out there. This is a strange and dangerous and sometimes awful time that we're living in, but the opportunity to go and to be part of one collective emotional experience, even if it's just for an hour, is the bomb that I think 
a lot of our souls need right now. So keep doing it, keep doing it. Do it at APT, do it other places. Um, that's how we keep art alive. That's how we keep this tradition of storytelling alive and well and thriving. And uh, it belongs to all of us. It belongs to all of us, not just a privileged few, but to every everybody who has the audacity to participate in. So I thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Carrie, for having me. And um, yay, stories, Thank you, everyone. Make me cry on a Sunday <laughs> afternoon. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Marisela. Thank you, Robert. <laughs>